Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We are doing a double header today. Later on the program, we're going to be joined by Chris Krebs. You know who he is. He was the head of Homeland Security's uh, Cybersecurity Election Monitoring Agency uh, and was fired by President Trump uh, by tweet because he wouldn't go along with the big lie. He's now the co-chairman of an Aspen Institute commission on uh, information disorder. And we'll talk to him about that and also about the experience of dealing with the big lie of being the guy that stood up and said, yeah, the election was not stolen. It was free, fair, it was secure. And then getting fired. And one of the things I want to ask him is what what is it like? What does it do to your head to know what the facts are and feel that in effect you are pissing into a hurricane? I'll probably use that phrase as well. For the first half of the doubleheader, they're going to be joined by the lone survivor. That's his handle for today, <laughs> uh, Congressman Adam Kinzinger. You're not the lone survivor. As long as there's Liz Cheney, you're not the lone survivor, are you, Congressman? No, there's a few of us, but you know, sometimes there's moments when you're, you know, walking around where you're like, I think I'm the lone survivor, you know, yeah, and I'm, well, and like I'm friends with Marcus Luttrell, I, you know, and, and, uh, of course, given the disaster going on in Afghanistan today, it's, I feel that this is appropriate. Well, I want to talk to you about that. Um, let's, let's, let's talk about your, some of the comments you made over the weekend, uh, because I could tell that there was one of those, um, it was kind of building up. You were you were building yeah. up to this conversation with Jake Tapper over the weekend. Let's let's just play this. It's in Jake. It's insanity. It's absolute insanity. Now, what President Biden said, maybe you could have said it slightly differently, is we're willing to come to your house to give you the vaccine. At no point was anybody saying they're going to break down your door and jam a vaccine in your arm despite your protests. This is outrage politics that is being played by my party, and it's going to get Americans killed. We are on a, our, our party has been hijacked. My party has been hijacked. It is on its way to the ground. And for some people, it's a fun ride, right? We can put out this outrageous stuff on Twitter. Yeah, I'm getting all these retweets and everybody knows me. I'm famous, but this plane is going to crash into the ground. Listen, if you are a Republican voter, do not listen to people like Marjorie Taylor Greene. The vaccine is safe. COVID is real. Get vaccinated because if you're going to listen to the outrage, by the way, in March, she's bragging about Donald Trump creating the vaccine. And now she's saying basically the vaccine's gonna kill you. Uh, I call on leader McCarthy. I call on every leader in the Republican party to stand up, say get vaccinated and, and to call out these garbage politicians, these absolute clown politicians playing on your vaccine fears for their own selfish gain. Now, uh, Adam, you probably heard that you were called out by Tucker Carlson. Uh, you made the big yeah. time last night. Tucker Carlson uh, attacked you and the governor of Arkansas, Asa Hutchinson. Uh -huh. but, but, but he singled you out and said you can't be held responsible because I think his phrase was because you're low IQ. So you really <laughs> you really didn't know what you were talking about there by urging people to get vaccinated. It's funny. He actually hit me two months ago and used the exact same thing, low IQ. So, That's I mean, sad. like, come up with some new stuff, yeah, and, know. you know, and Recycling. in the middle of it, he, I'm sure he did his, you know, famous Tucker cackle, which is like the ha, ha, ha. And you're like, what is that? Where does that come from? Yeah, I mean, look, it's – it's he's – I don't understand. So you remember the old joke and it, it started out as a joke where it's like, ha ha, Republicans remember vote on Tuesday. Democrats, your days moved to Wednesday. And everybody laughed. This is like 20 yeah. years ago. This is basically like telling your Republicans that the voting day is Wednesday beyond the human element of what's happening. Because I mean, you're telling Republican voters, whether you're Tucker Carlson, Marjorie, whether you're, you're, you're complicit in your silence, like Kevin McCarthy, just by being silent, because it's, it's too much to, to take on Donald Trump. These are Republican voters that aren't going to get vaccinated. These are Republican voters that are going to die. So if you don't care about all Americans like I do and like I know you do and most people listening do, and you only care about Republicans, well, then listen to cold hard facts. It is Republican voters that you are killing. Because you're telling them not to get this vaccine. Look, the Gestapo is not going to come uh, deliver a healthy item to your door to allow you to live longer. That's not what the Nazis did. So quit trying to bring comparisons to it. It's disgusting. And, and I think, Charlie, what's worse than seeing these people out there saying that – is all these members of Congress and, and leaders in the party who I had respect for and I believed had red lines they would never cross and I believe stood for something stand for nothing because it's going to hurt them just to simply say a vaccine works. 
Well, they stand for something. They stand for winning elections. And your analogy is that the uh, party has been hijacked. It, it appears more voluntary than that. And, yeah. and, and they, they apparently disagree with you that, that it's headed for the ground. Uh, they think this is a winning strategy. They, 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 you know, they, they think they think that going after this sort of thing is going to help them win the midterms. I, I can't quite figure that out, but that seems to be their calculation, right? Yeah, I think the sad thing is um, it may be beneficial somewhat for the midterms only because, you know, midterms are determined typically by – I mean the, the center, you know, the independents still have to vote, you know, the right way or whatever to vote for the, the people to take the majority. But – Typically, the midterms are just whoever turns out the most. And if you get your base furious and your base believes that the, you know, the uh, door to door vaccines is just a, a test run for taking your New Testaments, um, then, you know, you're going to make sure you vote. But the thing is, is I think if we would have been a party that right now would be making that we would have taken ownership for January 6th, we'd probably be beyond January 6th, It'd be a terrible thing in history. But if we took full ownership for it, I think we'd be moving on. And uh, and we could be talking about things like modernizing government, debt, economy, getting people back to work. And instead, you know, we're stuck in this just just garbage moment. And it's just it's an embarrassment. Well, it's an embarrassment. And it's also, as you point out, uh, highly, highly dangerous. Uh, there was a guy on Newsmax. I, I didn't care enough to actually look up his name because he's just a guy on Newsmax. But now <laughs> he's th this is what millions of I don't know how many millions of Americans watch Newsmax, but it, it's there. There's kind of this this race to the right where Newsmax and One America now have to be crazier than than Fox <laughs> News. So you have Tucker Carlson and Laura Ingram doing their anti-vax bullshit over on Fox News. But but on Newsmax, they're kind of upping the ante here. Um, just a brief soundbite from one of the guys from Newsmax. You know, I, I've one thing I've always thought, and, and maybe you can guide me on this because obviously I'm not a doctor, obviously. but when I've always thought about <laughs> vaccines and I always think about just nature and the way everything works. And, and I feel like a vaccination in, in a weird way is just generally kind of going against nature. Like, I mean, if, if there is some disease out there, maybe there's just an ebb and flow to life where something's supposed to wipe out a certain amount of people and that's just kind of the way evolution goes. Vaccines oh. kind of stand in the way of that. <laughs> so do medicines, wow. surgery, science, just this all this magic stuff out there. I just, you know, you, you kind of wonder in, in his head, did this make sense that there was something sort of unnatural about vaccinations? I mean, <laughs> I, the, the pandemic <laughs> wants to do what it wants. I mean, it wants to kill lots of people. And who are we to say that it shouldn't do this? Why are we introducing these? He said this out loud on television. Why are you guys having these Band-Aids? You know, yeah. if your wound is supposed to heal, it'll heal. If it's supposed to get infected, it gets infected, right? And, you know, the, the funny thing is, not funny, but kind of funny, yeah. is like he is – so I think that's what happens. And I'm, I, I don't know who this dude is. I assume he's probably under the age of 40. And, and I think you see this, this like, I don't know, this mid 20s kind of young 30s generation of kind of Charlie Kirk type conservatives that are that have learned that the way to be famous is to just be outrageous. And so there's really nothing that's out there. You know, they never learn from the political because they haven't seen mature politics in 25 years. So, you know, they're just out there trying to outstep each other. And by the way, to say that, you know, vaccinations are somehow unnatural, that sounds really like statist. That sounds like something that some statist leader would say to justify, you know, the large amount of people dying in this country. You know, I mean, I, you make an interesting point there about these people that want to be famous and they've sort of figured out what the model is. And so they they, they understand that if you say these outrageous things and you tweet it, that you're going to be part of that 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 ecosystem. So, and, and they're all in competition, which is why they're eating one another. I, I won't spend mm -hmm. any time on it, but I kind of love the, you know, Tommy Lahren versus Jenna Ellis, who's, you know, going back and forth at each other because there's like just a certain amount of crazy blonde bandwidth out there and they're competing yeah. for it. But, but here's the thing. I, and and I, I do understand the, the kind of the, the thrill of, of that kind of celebrity. And yet I have a hard time getting around the sense of, you know, that you're willing to say and do these things knowing that people might get sick and die as a result of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are other ways of doing it. And I guess that's where, let's leave aside the Charlie Kirks and the other, you know, just, you know, kind of, you know, low-level charlatan grifters here. 
you know, Kevin McCarthy, you know, wants to be the Speaker of the House of Representatives. He wants to be number three in the line of succession. And yet he is sitting watching as Donald Trump retcons the January 6th insurrection, turning Ashley Babbitt into a horsed vessel uh, type of, uh, mm -hmm. of, of, of martyr, spreading the big lie. You know, looking the other way when you have members of Congress uh, openly consorting with white nationalists uh, and then this anti-vax push. He could push back at any point, and yet he is completely, what, paralyzed, comfortable, hiding what? How, what what's going on with Kevin McCarthy? Well, he's – let me ask you a question. When was the last time that the Republicans have had a leader that has never done a single news network – Outside of like Newsmax and Fox. I mean, I remember when we huh. uh, elected Paul Ryan, and you know, one of the that. things we said is we need people to go out there on the non-traditional Republican media circuit to sell, you know, our message. So he would go on CNN, he would go on ABC, you know, and now I have not seen Kevin McCarthy do a single interview of anything of any consequence outside of Fox or Newsmax because he's going to get those questions and it's easier to not answer those questions. So let's talk about Ashley Babbitt, right? What happened to Ashley Babbitt is a tragedy, not because some cop murdered her. Uh, that police officer actually saved potentially the lives of more of her colleagues because as she went through the window, others would have, and they all would have lost their life, saved the life potentially of members of Congress. Um, but the tragedy of Ashley Babbitt is that there were people that misled her to believe that what she was doing was a jihad holy war on behalf of her country. You know, when, when, when you have members of Congress tweeting in the morning, this is 1776, and you have reason to believe that the government is run by pedophiles, you know, that are, that mm -hmm. it's not government for of and by the people, what you're doing in your, in your heart makes sense. It Ashley does. Babbitt, that the the shot on Ashley Babbitt, as sad as it was, was the right thing. And if you turn her into a martyr, uh, that's very dangerous. That is a really dangerous moment we're in. And Kevin McCarthy has been silent. Most members of Congress have been silent because it's just much easier to hope this organically fixes itself, kind of fix the glitch, you know, to use the office space term. And it's not going to. People have to speak out. You know, I, I, I wonder whether Democrats fully understand, and I'm not asking you to speak for Democrats, whether they fully understand the way in which uh, the narrative is changing, that, um, that Donald Trump and others are not just memory holding January 6th. They are, they are completely uh, flipping it on its head and putting a human mm -hmm. face. They're not talking about uh, Roseanne Boylan, the uh, the woman who was trampled to death uh, by by Trump supporters, they're not talking about Brian Sicknick anymore. The human face that they're trying to put on January sixth is Ashley Babbitt, the martyr, which turns everything around, turns it into this uh, patriotic uprising, and at the same time, um, they are aggressively pushing these the, you know the narrative of the big lie. And it's not that they necessarily will get an audit in Pennsylvania or Wisconsin that will do anything. What they're doing is they're keeping the base riled up. They're keeping the yep. issue alive. They're getting their clicks. They're, they're, they're still raising the money. And they're still freezing every other Republican from being able to move on and talk about substantive things. Yeah, and here's my bigger concern, too, is, you know, I think the – I'd say over 50, 60 – I don't know. I'm just pulling a number out. But probably about 60 percent of the Republican base, if like – God came down and said, here's the truth about January 6th. Here's the truth about Donald Trump. They'd be like, OK, you know, I'm on <clears throat> I'm on your side. I'm buying it. You know, let's let's actually listen to Kinzinger and Sykes again because mm -hmm. they, they said this, you know. But I do believe there is a significant part of this base and it's the radicals that are kind of outnumbered on Twitter. They're outnumbering on Twitter. So it seems like they're bigger than they are. But they honestly don't care what the truth is. Yeah. In their mind, there very well may be that Ashley Babbitt, you know, was shot because of what she did. They don't care. They don't care if Donald Trump was not elected because through their power and through their anger, they're going to gin up enough people that they can take power anyway. That's what's frightening to me is that it's impossible to reason with people that don't want to be reasoned with and already know what the truth is and don't care. No, and, and and that's that bothers me as well. It's the 
and, and I think that was hard to understand. It, it, it took it took a while for me to understand that why you can't fact check your way out of all of this um, mm-hmm. is because, well, what if, what if you're dealing with people that just don't care about it? OK, so let me just I, I think I ask you this every time you come on. So, <laughs> what you know, what is it like being the lone survivor? I mean, what, what is your your relationship and your interaction with your Republican colleagues in the House these days? So generally, it's pretty good. You know, behind the scenes, everybody, we don't really, you know, confront each other. And I guess unless you're Marjorie Taylor Greene, you're just running around looking for a reason to do that. Um, I I mean, I certainly feel that there's more distance now. And, uh, you know, part of that was COVID did that. But also, you know, I think I I don't want to sound like Mr. Awesome here or anything by saying this. But like when you're for like me, Liz and the other eight that voted to impeach, I think there's a lot of folks that just feel kind of ashamed that they didn't. Right. You know, people that, I mean, Charlie, I had conversations probably the day before the, you know, impeachment vote. And I had the number at 25. I thought there was going to be 25 people because they told me so. Mm -hmm. And now many of those 15 that didn't vote are out there, like being the hardcore supporters that were, were never anywhere else. So I think there's a lot of sense that, you know, uh, kind of a bit of a feeling of guilt. I think there's, you know, some concern that I'm going to out them as somebody that really so believes the election they, they, they wasn't stolen. Do they not make eye contact with you? Are they the kinds <laughs> of people that if they see you coming down the corridor, they, you know, suddenly, you know, have to take a cell phone call or, you know, shuffle <laughs> papers or go into the men's room or something like that? I there, mean, there's they, a just there's a couple like that. But no, for the most part, everybody's nice. But like I, I, I mean, I'm, I, could, I would put my hand on the Bible and swear that all but maybe two or three members of Congress know that January 6th was Trump inspired and know the election went to Biden, but they won't say a word. So people need to understand, though, that simply because you have taken these positions does not mean you have become a liberal Democrat or that no. you're going to vote with, with liberals. I, neither you nor Liz Cheney. So let's talk about some of the things that are going on right now. You, you made a brief reference to what's happening in Afghanistan. Give, give me your take on that. Uh, as somebody, yeah. you know, as, as as somebody who has thought and talked about that, you know, a great deal, uh, you, you described it as a disaster. It is a disaster, and and look, here's the here's the thing that I think was so wrong about this decision, but also recently, you know, Joe Biden said, well, let me ask every American, how many more, you know, lives is Afghanistan worth? How much longer do you want to stay? And it's like, that's not a question you ever pose hypothetically to an American, because as president of the United States, you're the one that answers that question. So you make the tough decisions. And it's like everybody, you know, I get all the, the, the questions occasionally on Twitter where people are like, well, Adam, why don't you go fight then? Or why don't you send your son? Why well, don't I have a son? Secondly, I already have been there and fought there. But the point is, as leaders, as president, you take the mantle of making a tough decision that nobody else can make. No other American can say any war is worth his or her son. Um, the problem is, Charlie, we have said from the beginning that the hope in Afghanistan is to prevent a terrorist a safe haven and also to, to encourage and, and equip the Afghans to do the vast majority of the fighting on their own. That's exactly what was happening. We had 2,500 troops there, 5,000 NATO. And that's what was required for 98% of the combat operations to be done by the Afghan military. I wake up this morning and I read that 22 Afghan commandos who are the best trained, and these are U.S. Mm -hmm. trained commandos, almost as good as ours, executed after surrendering to the uh, Taliban. They, they, the Taliban asked them to surrender. They surrendered. They executed them and stole their stuff. And, you know, it it is a, it is a sickening disaster. What we're going to see all because people like Rand Paul, you know, was using the term endless war. It wasn't a war. Even Donald Trump himself said this is a peacekeeping exercise now. It's not even a war. We still have peacekeepers in Kosovo that if we left, Kosovo could fall apart. It's sad. So w- 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 would it have been a better idea to stay there indefinitely like we are in Korea, Europe, Kosovo? No, I don't think indefinitely. You know, and you never want to have that. But I think if you look at Iraq, for instance, you know, when Bush sent the surge into Iraq, it was very unpopular. All his generals opposed it. And at that time, Al Qaeda Iraq thought that with all the pressure that was building, the second, you know, that Bush would leave. And that was that's what it appeared. And when Bush came out and said, not only am I not leaving, here's 20,000 additional troops. What that did, the 20,000, I was part of the search, the 20,000 additional troops was helpful. But what was most helpful was George Bush saying, we will not be defeated. We will not be defeated. And what you saw after that was a mass turning from, of Al-Qaeda Iraq 
to become the Sunni awakening where they became on our side. So with Afghanistan, when Obama surged in the, you know, I think it was like 2012 or something, 2010, he said, we're surging and we're leaving in 14 months. And so that Mm -hmm. did no good. I think the key is not that we're going to add more troops, but to say, look, we're standing by our Afghan partners. They're doing the bulk of the fighting. We want to negotiate with the Taliban, but it's going to be a real, verifiable, enforceable agreement. By the way, Donald Trump really screwed Joe Biden on this, though, because he really left Joe Biden with the decision to either add troops or withdraw. So uh, on, on, on a on a substantive issue, what is your what is your gut sense on infrastructure? And do you anticipate that you'll be voting for or against uh, whatever package comes out of the Senate? Yeah, I think if it's the if it's a negotiated package, the bipartisan thing that we're kind of seeing, I would I would for sure see myself voting for it. Um, You know, in my mind, this is something we have to get done. I think we need to have it's so impossible to have as, you know, as short term politicians we are. But we need to really talk about how we're funding infrastructure, gas tax. You got to have something for electric vehicles, whatever. So that to me is the most fiscally conservative thing is to pay for what we're using. But I would foresee myself voting for it. I guess recently the former president came out in opposition. So uh, we'll have some battle. But I think it gets done. I'm, I'm, that's one thing I'm optimistic about. Yeah, I, at the moment I am. And I think if we get that done, there'll be nothing else positive done till the election. That'll like that'll expend all of our actually doing something juice for a year and a half. So h- how optimistic are you? Speaking of bipartisan, uh, sort of bipartisan, uh, how how optimistic are you that the uh, that the House's January 6th commit committee yeah. uh, get to the bottom of, of what happened? Uh, it's it seems to still be on kind of a slow march, at least that way it feels on the outside. Yeah, I'm confident, um, you know, and, and it's part of what I'm what I've been trying to kind of talk to any of the Democrats that will listen to me is like, don't let this thing go off the rails. Right. And I think given, you know, they've got a lot of partisans on the committee, of course, but I, I think they're they're probably serious thinkers. We'll see who who or if, you know, whatever Kevin ends up doing on that. I think the addition of Liz Cheney was fantastic and I'm so glad it was her. Um, and uh, and so I think we'll get answers to it. But. The question is, you know, it, does this become a a Benghazi of which, by the way, we got answers from the Benghazi committee, you know, or are the Democrats going to have a very kind of mature, take your time, don't make this all about the politics and just get answers because those answers in and of themselves will have a political impact because seven months later, we're pretending like that was 10 years ago and we're still talking about that insurrection. Just move on, Charlie. Seven months ago. Yeah, seven whole months whole ago. Months. And, and of course, the president is now saying that it was uh, was completely peaceful. It was wonderful people, just wonderful people, and it was uh, was it was a was a love fest. I I would strongly urge people to see if you can if you can find it on social media. Mehdi Hassan actually had a video where he he plays. Donald Trump's comments, the audio of his comments over video of the actual <laughs> attack and the beating up of the cop. It, the, the juxtaposition is pretty powerful. Adam Kinsey. By the way, Charlie, yeah, yes. I'm 43. I was 42 when that happened. So <laughs> let's just let's, were, let's move on. You were so much younger then, just so <laughs> much more innocent. Adam Kinzinger, thank you so much for coming back on the podcast today. I appreciate it very much. Yeah, it was great. Anytime. And, and, and of course, uh, stick around because a part two is coming up. We're going to be joined in a moment by Chris Krebs. Hey, Charlie Sykes here. Uh, just a quick reminder. If you sign up for Bulwark Plus, you will have access to our morning newsletters to JVL's Triad, uh, as well as our whole suite of podcasts. This one will remain free. But if you want to listen to the secret podcast or uh, participate in our live streams, Uh, or others like the Next Level podcast, uh, please consider joining us. Here at The Bulwark, we we tell you what we think. We try to be non-shrill, non-tribal. And, and to stand back from the crazy and to call it out when, when, when we see it. And, that, and that's not always popular and it's not always easy, but we're very grateful for your support. And if you want to be part of all of this, uh, please consider joining Bulwark Plus. Hey, we're back and we're joined by Chris Krebs. We spent a lot of time talking about uh, cybersecurity, um, information, disinformation, the um, the pandemic of, uh, of conspiracy theories out here. And our guest today uh, is an expert among all of these. You, you'll, you will know the name, uh, Chris Krebs, who was the first uh, director of the Homeland Security Department's uh, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Thanks, thanks for coming on the podcast today. 
Thanks for having me on, Charlie. Good to be here. So you you had a very interesting career um, at, at this at this agency. So before we get into this, I, I want to talk to you about your your role as uh, as co chairman of the Aspen Institute's uh, new commission on information disorder and and what you guys are doing there. But tell me a little bit of background about your work with the Department of Homeland Security and and the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. What, what was your role during the election? Yeah. So I, first off, I, I came into the administration in March of 2017 as a uh, senior counselor to uh, John Kelly, then the, the first of many secretaries or acting secretaries in the Trump administration. Uh, and then over the, you know, the, the ensuing months, uh, as personnel changes uh, transpired, I ended up as the uh, acting undersecretary for an organization known as the National Protection and Programs Directorate, which is a, um, a headquarters component that effectively doesn't tell you really what it does. It's a very general name, uh, but it is the precursor organization to CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. And in the wake of the 2016 election and the Russian efforts to interfere, um, they, you know, as we pulled together the the plan to protect the 2018 and the 2020 election, CISA was on point primarily for with uh, for working with state and local governments, which under the Constitution, as we've heard ad nauseum over the last several months, are responsible for uh, administering uh, and, and actually conducting federal elections. Uh, but we also played a uh, educational awareness and, um, you know, debunking and prebunking role on countering election related disinformation of which there was plenty, both foreign and domestic uh, in the 2020 election. So you were fired after issuing a statement saying that the election was free, fair, and secure, that you didn't see any real problems at all in the 2020 election and said so. So that, you know, that statement, which was issued on November 12th uh, of, of 2020, was, was actually a group statement. It was uh, pulled together by state and local election officials, some federal uh, officials, uh, including from the Election Assistance Commission, which is the federal independent agency that's, that provides technical support to uh, uh, election administrators, uh, as, as well as the private sector some and some other folks that, that came together as a, as a part of a, um, a partnership we had developed, a public-private partnership is what CISA really excels at. Um, uh, that, that we pulled together. And, you know, these were the folks that actually knew what was happening with elections. And, and they're the ones that said that it was a secure election, that it was a fair and free election. So they issued uh, that statement through the coordinating council mechanism, which is that partnership. Uh, a CISA representative was a part of that, that, uh, that group. Uh, and so they issued that on the 12th. And then I, you know, I do what I was you know, did at the time uh, and retweeted it with a, a little TLDR statement on top that said it was a secure election. And I think that, you know, that caught the eye of a bunch of folks that, that didn't necessarily agree with that or appreciate that sentiment. So you came to the same conclusion, basically, that Attorney General Bill Barr came to, that that it was all bullshit, that there was no significant problems. And of course, we've seen how that 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 has played out. So I just wanted to get your take. You watched what was going on. You saw what was happening and what was not happening. And here we are sitting in July of 2021. The former president continues to push that lie. And tens of millions of Americans apparently believe stuff, including whether or not uh, some Italian satellites might have switched votes. How do you how do you or, get or, how do you? Yeah, I'm sorry. Or dead Venezuelan dictators and Hugo Chavez or, I, you know. Yeah. How, how did we get here? Um, right. Well, it, it, you know, there's there, there is a uh, certain <laughs> cohort of uh, people, including the former president, um, that just that they, they are, are apparently unwilling to accept the fact that um, that that they lost the election, that he lost the election. And and this is what, you know, more more broadly, I'm concerned about disinformation in general. But this one specifically, this single event. This big lie is, um, you know, it, it, it's frankly one of the scariest things that I've ever seen from a, you know, maintaining uh, our, our democracy here in the United States that that, you know, elections are, are really 
um, couched on two parties, assuming a you know a two party system, two parties, um, you know, accepting the outcome and uh, in, in moving on and participating in a peaceful transfer of power. And really, you know, what you're trying to do with elections are convince the losers that they've lost. And you know, the problem with that approach is that you have to have good faith actors on both sides. And you know, we 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 obviously don't have a good faith actor here. Uh, that that's not willing to accept that that this was a, a fair election. And again, you know, given the fact that we were sitting in the middle of a of a pandemic, uh, this was actually an incredibly well run election, and it was secure. There was no manipulation of the vote counts. There, you know, is you know, let's again, don't listen to me, listen to Bill Barr. There was no uh, certainly uh, no widespread fraud, and and I suggest that that even at a minimal level, uh, fraud was was virtually non-existent. So these are objective facts. These are numbers. This is hard data. We, we You know what, in fact, uh, the reality was. And, and I guess since we're going to get into the larger question of, you know, information disorder, th- this strikes me as the real problem is that is that you would think that this kind of objective evidence would have some weight or would have enough weight to dissuade people whose feelings were hurt. And yet you have this mass of evidence with with which you are familiar. Isn't it isn't it just disheartening and demoralizing that that the simple reality, the black and white facts are not enough to, to turn this around for millions of Americans and, and the political leadership of one political party? Yeah, I mean, this is kind of the the problem or the techniques that that um that that actors use in, in bad faith of um, you know deny distract discard and you know they can develop their own set of facts and you know they have a base that or a you know again a, a cohort a target audience that wants to hear uh, what what they are pushing and not necessarily what what the facts are mm-hmm. and, and in part that's what we're trying to get at in. Um, in the, in the commission is how do you build trust? How do you establish trusted information sources uh, that are that are undeniable? Yeah, well, you were a trusted information source. You you were the head of this department and you were appointed to this position, correct, by, by President Trump. He trusted you. And yet, when you told the truth about the election, he fired you by tweet. Were you surprised so, by that, by the way? Were you surprised that he fired you, considering that you were... A Trump appointee. <laughs> um, I, Natasha Bertrand uh, at the at the time um, I think was writing I think was writing for Politico. Um, it was the Tuesday. It was the prior Tuesday. He had written uh, an article that oh, said I oh, was I remember I, that I had expected to be fired, um, and. In that I was telling people I was expecting. I'm not sure I was telling people I was expected to be fired, but I think we all recognized that we were in, uh, uh, you know, strange territory. And it was, um, you know, we had a tenuous grasp on our jobs at best, which is fine. And and you know, in part, I think accepting your mortality uh, in a role like that is critical to be being able to to do the things you need to do to accepting. Um, that you're going to make decisions, you're going to say things, you're going to do things that that not everyone's going to like, uh, and it could cost you your job. But but you know, are you defined by your jobs? Or are you defined by how you act within your job? And and I chose the latter. So um, you know, when I was fired on that Tuesday evening, um, seven oh nine p.m. Eastern time, <laughs> I believe. Uh, <laughs> give, give or take a few minutes. Uh, I can't check the tweet because it's been deleted now. No. Oh. Um, but. You know, I was surprised, but not shocked. Right. You know, I kind of had a sense that it was going to happen. It was inevitable to a certain degree. Um, But it was I was not expecting it at at that moment. But I, you know, I'll I'll never forget sitting there and I just walked in after what was at the time a not too late day at the office at 7, you know, 7 p.m. ish walked into the house and and somebody texted me and said, hey, you you just got the axe on Twitter. And uh I was like, no, you got to be confusing me with somebody else. And I pull up, the, you know, Twitter. I was like, oh, there it is. And uh, my kids were really excited. I'll, I'll tell you that much. Your kids, okay, that's good. 
I think they were they were looking forward to getting their their dad back after being in the throes of election security work for for years. But well, it's, it's also um, kind of it's kind of you know impressive to get to fired by you know on Twitter by the president of the United States. So I mean, there was that, right? Yeah, that, right. That's probably the the uh, simplest way to put it. There's that. So the reason I'm we're backing into this is the this this commission on information disorder. I, I, I guess. What are the answers to this? I mean, having gone through all of this, is as you you put out the this uh, letter from the co chairs uh, today, pointing out it will take the whole of society and time to climb our way out. And I'll I will admit to you, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is I get asked this all the time: What is it going to take to break this fever? What is it going to take to get out of this pandemic of conspiracy theories and everything? And and I I don't have a I don't have a good answer and and you 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 and the members of this commission have spent a lot of time studying this so I guess I want to talk about your interim report and how optimistic you are that we actually can get our way out of this and this is not and we're not just screaming into the you know like you know pissing into a hurricane. Uh, given what's happening right now, because I do often feel like we're pissing into the hurricane, trying to fact check these people, trying to push back, trying to say, hey, here are the actual facts. Nothing seems to register. Why do you think that you have come up or do you think that you and members of the commission have come up with with an answer to that? Oh, we we do not have the answers yet. Uh, you know, this is the interim report. This is the the framing of our uh, approach for the developing the real recommendations. And, and just to kind of step back for a minute, um, as you pointed out, this is this is truly one of those global societal challenges that one, there's no silver bullet. There, there's no single organization or individual or country or company or, you know, I could go on that's going to fix this. And whether it's entirely fixable in and of itself um, is, I think, still under under a healthy debate and and you know I'm not um you know I'm, re- I'm certainly not expecting that we're going to we're going to wave a wand here and fix everything but but my you know my bigger uh takeaway coming out of the the last administration was not about the leadership it was not about you know any one individual thing it was that as I participated in a number of different uh whether it was a national security uh, activity like you know, protecting elections from foreign uh, interference, you know, or it was just broader cybersecurity issues um, that, that, you know, if you have a real national security level issue, if you have a real na- uh, societal uh, challenge, then, then you, you do the work required to understand what the problem set is, what the challenges are, and then you build a strategy around it to, uh, achieve whatever your your objectives are, and to date, from a countering disinformation perspective, the United States government has not done that. It did not do it in the last administration. I haven't seen necessarily a a you know the equivalent of a counter disinfo czar, or not that I'm advocating for more czars, but uh, you know we need it as a government to take it seriously. And so, as I was thinking through what my you know handover letter to my uh subs you know my my successor which you know hopefully by the time this airs will uh, have been confirmed in jen easterly at CISA, um was a, was let's take this seriously let's let's make a strategy let's pull a task force together uh and and take it, you know from a government approach engage in in a meaningful conversation with a clear set of uh a clear-eyed approach um and recognizing that the biden administration had a list of or their to-do list was about a thousand things long when Aspen approached me and said, we're thinking about pulling this commission together. Are you interested? I said, absolutely. Anything we can do to pull together a set of recommendations uh, for not just government, but for civil society, for the private sector, for media, for international partners uh, to tackle, then, then I think that was a, uh, you know, something that at least I could give, continue to give back from a public service perspective. Um, you, 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 I'm I'm sorry. I just did no, just, just back up a little bit. You're you're with the co-chairman of of this committee uh, along with uh, Katie Couric and uh, Rashad Robinson is the president of the Color of Change and very diverse group of people on this commission, um, including including Prince Harry, the Duke of uh, Sussex, former Congressman uh, Will Hurd, Gary Kasparov, the uh, Russian chess champion, world chess champion, um, and uh, and Catherine Murdoch among others. 
Catherine Murdoch could just like call up some of her relatives, like, right? I mean, it's like, I mean, it's like Catherine. Not at all. Um, but you know, just like it's like, hey, at the next family barbecue, could you do like three things? Like, could we just knock this off? So I, I, I you know, I see that you've broken down some of your priorities into business structures, um, user resilience, um, which is you know, why people accept all of this and then what government's role can be. I guess I, I'm I'm struck by I, I I want to get your take. Have you have you figured out how you're going to deal with the social media platforms? Because uh, they seem to be now caught between this ideological vice that that if they exercise judgment about um, disinformation, falsehood, uh, uh, you know, white supremacist propaganda, uh, they're criticized as being part of of cancel culture, and and yet. Um, if they, if they don't, then they're going to be riding the tiger. So what, you know, how, how do you counter a business environment where all of the incentives are put out the most inflammatory, negative, frightening things, because that's what people want to read. They don't want the good news and the falsehoods travel much faster than true information. How do you confront that business reality? Well, that's that's in part what we're exploring. We're looking at the various mechanisms that, for one, the government has to to drive change and drive action. Section two thirty, of course, is always the the shield that's brought up that we need to take a look at that. You know, in in that is there seems to be you know interest on uh, taking a harder look at section two thirty, um, which which provides right now liability protections. Um, for, for the platforms, for, you know, anyone really to say whatever they want. And they're not, you know, considered publishers. They're, they're the platform. Um, the, the, there's interest across the political spectrum, I think, for, for different reasons. Uh, but nonetheless, Section 230 is certainly something that we'll take a look at, but, but not stopping there. There are other uh, mechanisms from a transparency perspective. And how do we open up the aperture and kind of pull back the curtain so that, you um, so that so that security researchers can take a look at the algorithms that are driving the the business models and, and the way that content is being served up in some cases um, in very you know targeted stylized fashion that that is you know very dang well dangerous isn't necessarily the right word but you know some content that's that that is just not um, um, you know a- appropriate and so. Those are the sorts of things that we're going to continue to look at um, through, you know, what can government, what levers does the government have? What more can the government do from a disruption perspective when you have foreign adversaries and intelligence services? Um, you know, the Russian and the Internet Research Agency uh, is is the classic example there. Uh, but also there are angles that we need to take a look at of, of the, you know, the dissolution or the, you know, how uh, local and regional media outlets mm-hmm. uh, have have you know just withered away in the in the last several years. Huge and then I'm actually really interested in the impact of COVID uh, for one and kind of human cognition and how things you know the, the pulling back into the into your home for a year and a half and the loss of community engagement how that's changed the way people have consumed information how they uh, how they actually engage and interact with information. So how do you think that works? Um, is, is it because we, we, we stopped having contact with actual real human beings with real um, relationships and we became part of these tribal cyber communities in, in, in which we were fed this disinformation and these, these dopamine hits? Do you think that that's one of the reasons why the, the crazy has accelerated so fast over the last uh, few months? It feels like there's just so much of it. I know, it part it, of it. Yeah, there's so much of it. It kind of resonates. But the thing I always think about is, you know, whatever town, city you're in and you're walking down the street and you see someone standing on the corner who is just ranting and raving and spouting, <laughs> you know, nonsense. And, you, you know, you, I don't know if it's shame or, or just reason that keeps you from joining that person on the corner or taking whatever he's saying and, and amplifying it. But but when we're on Twitter, when we're on social media, when we're in these so chat true. rooms, we don't have that same reaction there's a you know the anonymity that we interact with we you know we tend to for some reason lose our shame <laughs> um but but you know those are the elements my uh, my hope particularly with the the 
outbreak of QAnon and in those conspiracy theories that are ultimately disinformation. Uh, that that as we you know as we you know reopen the economy, reopen the world, and we engage again in in our however it is in our community, it, it, whether it's at the baseball game or in church or whatever, assuming those things haven't taken root and become and become kind of a plank or platform uh, that that we can get people having conversations again, like, wait a second, that doesn't make sense after all. So one, one last question here. You, you, one of your, your focuses is, is on what you call user resilience, which is, you know, media literacy, civic literacy, you know, basically giving people the tools to resist this, this disinformation. And I have to admit that I, I blushed hard when I read your, or, or, you know, initial discussion of that. Because I was a member of the Knight Commission on Restoring Trust in Democracy and Media, which mm-hmm. ha- which had a little bit of overlap. And this was my big contribution. Um, my contribution. This was what I was really most interested in, which was we needed to have a, a really aggressive media literacy, citer- civic literacy program. Because if people were smarter, if they knew stuff, they would be more resistant. I now think that was incredibly naive. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. Because in part... I do wonder now, and I, I, I wonder what Gary Kasparov is going to say about this as, as well, whether or not we are naive to think that people actually really want to know what is true, um, as opposed to wanting to know what bonds them to their tribe and their community, that a lot of this is about membership. It's about belonging to that community. So therefore, the fact checking just doesn't work. Um, they may know that things are wrong, but... Uh, they understand that this is the world that they live in and that, that uh, you know, that maybe that's why we feel like we are, you know, screaming into the void so often. And it's simply saying if we just had more civics education and more history education and more media uh, literacy, this would this would help. I, and and this was this was something that I really believed in. I I wrote a whole chapter about you know the crisis of citizenship and how we needed to reinvigorate the concept of citizenship, and I believed it at the time. And now I look back at it and I go, man, I um, greatly underestimate the challenge that we face. This it doesn't mean you don't do it, right? Yeah, yeah. well, you got to um, try, right? Th- there's. In that, again, this is why this is such a whole of society effort. It's a generational effort. One of the things that we are really striving for in the commission is to release actionable, immediately actionable recommendations, but recognizing that there are a number of longer term fixes that we're going to have to or, or engagements that we're going to have to to roll out. Um, but but we've got to set that work plan. We've got to be able to identify some of those issues. But you know, as I think back, and for me, and, you know, I'm tr- trying not to be a one-trick pony here, but a lot of it does come back to 2020 election. Sure. And you know, in part, what the disinfo actors and the put the the proponents of the big lie, what they took advantage of was the lack of transparency in some cases of how elections work. Mm-hmm. You know, it, to most people, elections are you show up, you cast your vote. And then you turn on the TV that night to figure out who won. And that's just not how it works. And so we tried to engage in a lot more patience building. Um, we had, we had a, it's just a working with some of our partners. We had, you know, be a 3P voter. It's very kind of trite when I think back about it, but it's, you know, be prepared, know what your voting plan is, participate, get out there and vote, uh, but also be a poll worker if you can. Um, and third is be patient because in the explosion of, of mail-in voting, the processes uh, can take a little bit longer uh, to to count the vote, um, and particularly in states where, like Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, where you can't open up the ballot yeah. to count it until the morning of November third, and and it was just it was not possible that uh, we would have a full count uh, that evening, and and yet some continue to push the narrative that. You know, elections are called that night. That's just not how it works. So, again, there are I think there are simple civics education yeah, like that. Uh, steps that, that we can take. And, and then just more broadly on that of of educating people how, you know, call the grift, call the game, uh, tell them how they're being manipulated, tell them how um, foreign influencers or domestic influencers in this case use platforms to take advantage and drive narratives. And, you know, I've said this before, um, 
But January 6th was entirely predictable. It followed the disinformation operator's playbook, the five-step playbook. First, identify the issue. Second, mobilize the accounts and drive uh, the story. Third is amplify the story. Fourth is take it mainstream, which means get it on get it on the news channels. And then fifth, take it real world. In real world, taking it real world was driving the Stop the Steal rallies on January 6th and getting those people in place to go attack uh, the Capitol. And I guess the extraordinary difference that you lived through between 2016 and 2020 was that while in 2016, we worried about uh, foreign interference, uh, in 2020, the vector of the disinformation was right here. It was, yep. it was domestic. So when are you going to come up with the final report? When should we look for this final report from uh, the Aspen Institute's Commission on Information Disorder? So early fall, um, September-ish, um, we will have our recommendations out. But but the important part uh, to keep in mind here, as, as I've already said, is that you know we, this is just the beginning. Um, Aspen will have follow-on work. We're hoping that other groups uh, join the call and hop in and pick up some of the recommendations and run with them and, and add their own recommendations or stylize as, as they see fit. Uh, but, but this is, you know, for the rest of our lifetimes that we're going to be in this, uh, you know, uh, in this struggle. Chris Krebs, thank you so much for joining me. And again, that is the Aspen Institute Commission on Information Disorder, which is out with its preliminary um, report uh, today. Thanks for coming on today, Chris. Thanks, Charlie. And thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We'll be back tomorrow. We will do this all over again.